either the ones that were by right or by previously <coughs> by special use permit to verify that the person residing in the unit is still an eligible resident. If you have any other questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions by committee? Okay, I understand there's some. Any other questions? Yeah. How big is the lot? This acre, it's a 5.15 acres. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot that's what I would call like the, the deep lot. You know, it has a, I think it's 300. It's narrow and deep. Narrow and deep, yeah. And the echo unit would be about 100 feet behind the existing home in an area where there's, a, if you look down the west side, there'd be a, a detached accessory structure. Uh, and then on the east side of the property, there is there is a home there, but it's a little bit further north of where the echo unit would be. And there's a solid wall of evergreen um, screening. And even on the east uh, or the west side of the property, there's a good amount of screening as well. Both of the adjoining lot owners, those two on the direct east and west, are not opposing the request. It doesn't meet all of our setbacks. It, yeah, it, it, the echo unit is always required to meet all of the underlying zoning setbacks. So out of the eight objectors that were there, not one of them was from the property directly? Not directly or east or west, but one of them was, had they touch a small portion, like maybe 20, 40 feet, on this very southern part of the property. But in the bulk of the lots are narrow and deep, just like this one, and then there's a small <coughs> section where another one touched. I understand some people did sign up to come and talk. Uh, uh, I don't have a list. Do you have a list? Uh, would the property owner like to come up and, and say something? My name is Jimmy Walsh. I'm a supervisor with Manhattan Township. The reason I came to this meeting is the township asked per se, I understand that there's a disability in this family. So the township uh, can't fight the, the disability thing on this echo housing rule. But the reason that I wanted to come to you is about this whole echo housing situation. The neighbors, there were a lot of neighbors there that night complaining that what is to stop this? There's a lot of E1, E2, uh, A1 parcels out there all in a row, and they're all very nice houses. They're very nice, and there's going to be some more developed there. What their concern is, is how can we not create a monster here by having other housing, other people wanting to do this? And the reason, and, and it's, this is my fault for not studying this, ahead of time before the other meeting. But one of the rules in this echo housing thing, on the uh, second page of it, it says at least one of the occupants of the echo housing unit must be at least 62 years of age or unable to live independently because of disabilities, which we understand. Now it says all disabled occupants must submit a letter from a licensed physician verifying the disability. The, the deal with this that I don't I don't like for our township or any township 
is that all you have to actually have to be is 62 years or older and you can put a trailer on your property such as this. You don't have to be disabled. If that were the situation, I could have had my kid move into my house 10 years ago. I live on five acres and, and I could be living in a trailer in the back with no disabilities whatsoever. That That is what I wanted to bring up. I know that this just got recreated uh, and it's something that I should have seen before, but I didn't, I didn't pay enough attention. And it appears to me that this situation should be changed, adjusted somehow, I don't know with the age. The disability, if you wanna take care of your parents, I understand that, that's totally understandable. It's, uh, it's the way of life, it's the way it should be. But this with this, and they could start lining them up along there on those two and a half, two acre tracks uh, with anybody that's over 62. So that, that's what I wanted to say to you is, is I just don't think that the rules are all right in this situation. Thank you. Any comments by the Thank you. So I'd like to ask again, how many uh, echo housing units do we have in Will County, please? Again, can you tell me that? So we have 18, so we have 18, um, 18 units. So it's not it's not cheap to go ahead and put an echo house out there because you have to buy the mobile home, you have to put it in a septic system, you have to run the water line, you have to run the electricity. It's not cheap, it's not something somebody just does willy-nilly and not everybody wants to have their parents living there. Some people choose that. I, I don't see it as a threat. If there's only 18 right now, we've been doing echo housing for how many years? 30, 40 years. For 30, 40 years, I don't see it as a, as a big threat. I think that um, I would have loved to have done it in my situation at one point in time right now. It's unrealistic because of the, situ the advanced age of uh, <coughs> relatives. But if you have somebody that you can, can do, I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense to do it. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it popping up all over because of the fact that it is not a cheap thing to do. You have to go through all the building code process and everything like that. You just can't pop a trailer on there and say, okay, we're gonna run a hose from the house over here and use the same sector. You can't do that. So there's a big cost incurred and there's a big commitment for the family who's choosing to move their parents out there. And every year we have an inspection that to prove that her kids aren't living there now because her parents have moved to Florida. They can't, you can't do that. So as long as that's in place and you make good track of it, I don't think you're going to see it as, I don't think you're going to see it popping up all over. Thank you. Okay, the next person I have. I have a comment as well. Um, I have a question. Once they're done using these, say that the parents, whatever the situation may be, are they mandated to remove that? Within six months, the unit would have to be removed from the property. If they didn't meet that guideline, then we would initiate a code enforcement process. Okay. That being said, I agree totally with what Judy is saying. I do live in a more rural area. And, and not showing any disrespect to anybody that lives next door, but I see this happening on a regular basis. Kudos to you for stepping up to the plate and wanting to have your parents by you. Okay? because I'm gonna be dealing with that shortly as well, and I don't have the property to keep my mom close, okay? So I, I don't think this is gonna become an issue either. I think it's a cost-effective way, it's a safety issue, and then you go from there. But again, kudos to you for doing this. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything that Judy and Lori said, and you know, there's an important point that we have to recognize that in our society, it costs a lot of money to live nowadays. So the property taxes keep going up, groceries go up, everything else goes up. And just because when you say disability, there's other disabilities besides being physically disabled. You know, you could also have not enough income to support yourself. So if your kid is willing to take you in and help you out and go through the cost, to put a trailer up, like Judy was saying, all the added costs. What are, you, what are you supposed to do with your parents? Throw them out in the street and tell them go live at the Y? You know, so, you know, I agree with both of them. And it's a real important thing to, to realize it's not always a physical disability. It can also be 
a money, a monetary disability. Thank you. Okay, uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Don. Uh, Seabrooks. property at about the uh, year 2000 and uh, at that time my attorney asked me do I want to put further restrictions on it and I said no uh, the county restrictions are such that I think that they would prevent anything from occurring there that uh, that would not be in keeping with the area and uh, I, I totally agree with taking care of your parents Henry. that that is not the question here uh, I have a 91-year-old mother. We have a townhome for her in New Lenox. We have home care, health care. Uh, most of the children are only 10 minutes away and stay in the area so that we can help her out. Um, there are other ways that this could be done besides putting a trailer in. There, uh, from what I understand, that uh, they have uh, a finished basement, and that if that would be too difficult, uh, an addition could be put onto the east side of the house for probably about the same cost as this trailer is. And if they, and I know that it was stated that they wanted to have their own separate area, but you could put separate doors in and everything, and would actually be, you know, if you're talking about taking care of somebody who is disabled or needs help, why would they put a trailer 100 feet from their home when they could have an addition onto the home, just put separate doors on it? Uh, there were some things and again, I'm not against, I, I will totally believe in taking care of your parents, uh, whether that be financially, whether that be health care, uh, mental support, etc. So that is not the issue here. The issue is there are many people, myself included, who have a very large investment in the area. Um, I happen to own 42 acres in the area, that, but we had eight people get up and talk about how they have a large investment, and it takes in our area a couple of years to sell a home because the homes are more expensive and so when somebody comes in and they're going to sh uh, lay down a half a million dollars for a homestead they go through the area and they look at what's in there and if they say there are trailers in this area that may or may not um, impact the sale of their home whether it, it, there's already one that was uh, up for sale about two years ago for 530 is now down to 450 so in order to sell a home that people and it's a nice home but in order to sell a home that's what you have to do when when there are issues in the area that uh, make people not want to buy there were some things said last time and mr radner stated that once that zoning is in there then you know another person could come in and and uh and live there so i don't know if that is correct if i misunderstood and then and they only have to be hud approved and so that has nothing to do with aesthetics or anything like that which is what this is about is you know aesthetics and you know that all what your neighbors have and what, you know and impacts what your house is worth um there was one lady who was state, state, not not here, but at the last meeting that was stated that she lived in a multi echo housing type of situation, but they had 120 acres, so that's ag. And they've been doing multiple homes on ag for decades and maybe even longer. Um, that goes back to the where it used to take multiple families to run a farm. Um, and like I said, the, the, uh, the parental care and, and the disability might be better served if they had an addition. And I'd have no problem if they put an addition on their home. But like I say, I'm not only myself, but other people have have uh, a big investments in this area. And if they you know, lose money, and there was uh, one comparison that she brought in that, oh, there was one, a realtor said that they did not lose money on um, their echo sale. But there was only one comparison, and that's not enough of a pool to make any any kind of rational decision about that. Uh, um, what you need, if they brought in every Echo Housing unit that was sold, and, and they said nobody lost money, well, that might be a little bit different. But and that, and then you don't know what the price of those homes were, because if a home was valued at 150 or 200 thousand, then it's easier to sell those homes. When you go up to a half a million dollars, like many of the homes in our area are. 
that it's more difficult to sell at home even if you have no distractions. And uh, like I said, I, I developed this area. Um, I would have put more restrictions if I thought in any way that the county uh, would would do this. You know, ag rating is different, and these people have options. There, she stated that it's going to cost eighty thousand dollars to put this in. For eighty thousand dollars, you could probably put an addition on the east side of that home, maybe a little more. Um, but but then you would have something that really adds to the home also. So they, they ought to maybe think about uh, looking toward you know what their investment is too. So anyway, I'm, I'm against it. We had quite a few people in the area who were against it, and um, they're not here today because they're probably all working. Thank you. Steve, you have Yeah, uh, what are the property tax, I'm going to ask you a question. Me? Yeah. Okay. What are the uh, average <coughs> property taxes over there? Uh, they're pretty high. Uh, you know, uh, Manhattan Township, but uh, the guy's pretty tough on everybody. Put a flower pile. But okay. The reason um, I'm asking that is with the echo housing, the property tax isn't going to go up. And with an uh, addition, the property tax is going to go up. And so now, if you look over at the person 62 and that they're fortunate enough to live five years, how much is the tax cost in five years? The next thing is when you're talking about property. Add it up in your mind, property tax. Right now, if your average tax is, uh, I'm taking a wild guess, because you say it's real high, 15,000? Um, some might be there. 10,000? Yeah, 10, 10 right. to 15. So mm -hmm. if you pay 10,000 and then you have an addition put on, which makes your house go up another 2,000? Possibly. So, and then with that's no longer an echo house, so now you're stuck with that for the rest of the duration of the thing. Who's going to buy your house? Nobody wants to buy houses anymore with high taxes. You can't, that's why the value goes down because the taxes are so high. So I'm just pointing it out that you know, you're saying to do A, but A doesn't really match up with what's in reality. Right, it's, it's all going to be, you know, I've and, dealt and, with And our zoning ordinance allows right now to do that. And every year it gets checked. And if it's no longer a proper use, say the person that's 62 there is moves, then they gotta get rid of the trailer. It doesn't stay there permanently. It stays there till the use is gone. So But it can't stay but it's not it can't taxed. stay permanent. But it's not taxed. Oh it's taxed. It's not property taxed. Oh yes, it's gonna be no, taxed. It's not. it's not taxed at all. Not on property no. tax. Oh wow. So, I mean, that's the reason they're doing it. Yeah, right. To save them money, but to but save them the money on the backs of the people no, in the neighborhood. No. Yes. People in the neighborhood are losing money because they are on their home value because property tax keeps increasing. Well, I, There's I, a direct correlation between property tax and home value. Well, then you got to look that up. There's and also a the echo house as well. That's also the idea. Okay. Right, you're right. You're right. I get a little carried away. Here. <laughs> Can I just say one thing about that? That they, that might be impact, but there's also an impact of people selling homes when when things in the neighborhood get undesirable. Thank you. Uh, one more uh, speaker, uh, Charlie Peterson. I'm here for the bees. I'm yeah. here for the bees. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments by the committee? Any questions? I'd like to. I don't want to take up a lot of time. I just kind of wanted to address um, some of these things. We just moved into the house in March. Um, I've just I've been in conversation with the land use department actually since December before we even purchased the home. There was three things that we wanted. We wanted property that I could keep our two horses on our property. We wanted good school districts for my three and five year olds, and we wanted a property that would allow us either an in-law suite, um, a property that would allow us to build an additional house for our parents or something that would fit. Um, when I spoke, I think our first conversation was with Dawn, um, I spoke with her and she told us that within Will County to find a property that would allow us to build two separate homes wasn't going to happen. Um, but she did say we do have this program called the ECHO program and these are the zoning restrictions, this is the ordinance, it was just revised. Took a copy of that and then we began our search with our realtor. So I did, you know, kind of go into this. This is not a decision that we've made lightly. This is not something that we 
just decided to do. This has been since December and January, before we even closed on our home in March. Um, before we even did this petition or you know, signed up for this special use, um, I spoke to both neighbors. I do have a letter on file from my neighbors directly to the west um, who will actually be impacted the most by this. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to print out, but I did just get an email as we were walking in. Um, it's on my phone, electron electronically signed from my neighbors to the east, directly to the east, saying that they have absolutely no objections. Um, like Mr. Shrevo said, our property abuts his in the back far corner. Um, I do have pictures if anybody's interested. I'd like to come armed with more information than I need. Um, exactly, he may be able to see the roof line of the mobile home. Um, this is a brand new mobile home. There is a picture, I believe, on, on record. Um, it's brand new. It will match the property. Um, we're planning on planting trees around it to even more screening for not only my parents, um, but for the neighbors as well. This is something, like I said, that we did not go into haphazardly. Um, as far as to, um, my father is here. He's 67 years old. And while he's not disabled at this point by age <coughs> standards, he is handicapped. He is an amputee. Um, mobility is becoming an issue. I would love it if my parents would continue in the same quality of life they have now. Unfortunately, I know that's not the case. Um, mobility is an issue. So while I appreciate everybody's concern and opinions as to what I should do with our property, um, putting my parents in a basement is not an option for me. Um, it's not a walkout, it's not a lookout basement, and it has a steep flight of stairs. I do have an extra bedroom upstairs. Unfortunately, that's a large flight of stairs as well. Will not work for my parents long term. And as far as the addition, I did discuss it. And if you look at my property directly to the west, those neighbors have been there for quite some time. They were unaware of the ECHO program when they built an addition on their home for their elderly parents who have since passed. Now they have a, I want to say almost 6,000 square foot home with six bedrooms, four bathrooms, and their tax bills are almost $17,000 a year. That is not financially something I am able to do. Um, and they also said they're going to have to stay in their house for the remainder of their life because it's a very specific home. And their home is valued far more than any other property in the surrounding areas. Um, so that's kind of how we decided to do, if I had to explain why, that's why. Um, I did speak with Joe Aldani, who was the Manhattan Township Assessor, Tax Assessor. I spoke to him back in June. Um, I did ask him if this ECHO unit, before we went forward with it, would affect our tax rates, would affect our property values in any way, shape, or form. I was told from his opinion it would not. It would not increase our taxes because of the way the ordinance is written and the type of structure that it is. So I did also contact them. Um, and like Mr. Shriva also said, the, the community was developed in 2000. This ECHO program has been around for 30 to 40 years. I also did FOIA request a location of all the other ECHO properties in the area, and I mapped them out. There is no proof that these echo units aren't placed in it's not like one would put one up and somebody else would it doesn't fit everybody not everybody wants their parents with them i do i want them by me i want to be able to walk outside and bring them dinner i don't want to hop in my car and even drive five minutes i watch my grandmother battle cancer my mother lives seven minutes from her and still could not get to her when she needed them we had to call neighbors we had to call an ambulance when she wouldn't answer her phone I hope my parents never get to that point, but it's a reality of aging. I've seen it happen. It's going to happen to all of us. And my parents, I'm sorry, my parents deserve that from me, and I owe that to them. And they should be allowed the dignity and the respect and the privacy to live as independently as they can. I have no intentions on keeping this echo unit other than what the intentions are. If my parents, God forbid, have to go to a new nursing home, or I have to move them into my home for more care. I will do that, and I will gladly remove this unit. I have no intentions on keeping this other than what it's intended. Um, I have a letter from my realtor who sold us the home saying that in her professional opinion, this does not decrease property values. I maybe even went a little, probably past where I should, and I pulled the equal properties that are closest to where our home is. 
Um, I was able to pull tax records for the previous five years, um, and they are all consistent with the area. I also did pull not only the tax record for the actual property itself, but two neighbors that were close by to show that their taxes have increased on trend with the rest of the community. They have not decreased at all, has not taken away property values. Um, there's, there's just, I understand the concern, but it's conjecture at this moment. It's not based on any proof. There's nothing to substantiate any of these claims. I paid a lot of money for my home. I pay $11,000 in taxes. I would never do something, and they don't know me, I understand that. There were eight people here, actually six that spoke, along with, and then Mr. Walsh from the township. Um, none of those people are here today. Um, I believe, from what I've heard, that um, they were kind of given the information that, oh my God, these people are gonna put a trailer in their, in their backyard, it's bad for the neighborhood. I believe that once I was given an opportunity to speak, once they saw pictures of the unit, um, they're not here today. Um, so I believe that having the proof, seeing what they've seen, you know, it, I think it made a big difference. I also, I took pictures of our property. I know Brian has them in his file. I parked my large F-250 truck in the location of where the property is going, where the unit will be. Um, and then I walked down my driveway. This is a midway point from my driveway. The tree coverage here blocks the unit from the street. When you get all the way to the end of my driveway, and I understand the truck is not the same size as this unit, but when you get all the way to the end, this is my home. This is the tree line, and then this is the tree line to the east. Um, you can't see, you can't even see my barn, basically behind my house, a little corner of it. Um, so I don't believe that many of these people who were approached with this kind of notice that these people are doing this would have even been aware that this unit was even there unless they saw it being installed or it wasn't brought to their attention. Um, again, you know, I didn't, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that we would have kind of this kind of, I guess, issues with this. Um, it wasn't my intention. Like I said, I love my community. I take pride in my home. Um, I take pride in my community, my neighbors. We have very good relationships with the neighbors who have met us and know our family and know the standard which we take care of our property. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. Now we got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with all due respect to the gentleman that spoke, um, I understand it's some of what he was saying, but again, um, it's a person that works with seniors all the time. I'm giving you kudos for stepping up to the plate for your family because you know what? I don't see that very often. Secondly, um, the understanding that you lose so much as we move forward in life. I don't like to call it aging because I'm doing the same thing. We move forward in life, and as we move forward in life, we have to, so many things taken away from us. And independence for them, if that's that last shred of dignity that they have left, because now they're turning to their kids, we need to afford that to them. You remember what it was like getting your driver's license? Do you remember that? You know how cool that was? Think about having to take that away from them. Watch this happen to my grandparents. Exactly. And how hard that is on them. And in this case, you're, you're allowing them the independence. You're allowing them to have the ability to get out and do things. Because guess what? We have a huge aging population. And again, if I could do this for my mom, I would do it. I don't have the property to do it. God bless you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Any other comments by the committee? We have a motion to approve. Motion. Second. A motion and a second. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. One, two, no. One, no. One, no. Okay. <coughs> uh, next case, uh, Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, zoning case ZC 17 040. Takes place in Longport Township. Um, it concerns about a 33 acre parcel that's currently zoned R2. Um, it was rezoned in 1999. Um, the applicant sent on Holly Lopez who would like to rezone the property to C6 in order to develop it as an outdoor soccer facility. 
Um, his organization, Chicago International Soccer Club, um, would like, you know, has been kind of in the area, but would like to purchase their own piece of property. Um, they provide training to kids as early as three or four years old, up to high school, um, just before they would leave to college. Um, the city of Lockport um, has met with the applicant a few times. They did request the continuance of the case at the Planning Zoning Commission hearing last week. Um, recent correspondence between the applicant, myself, and the planner of the city of Lockport, Kimberly Phillips, um, it was determined that they weren't going to hear it, which would have been this evening, um, that they had no sort of objection to it. Um, they weren't going to hear it themselves with their Planning and Zoning Commission, but they would want, they might have opinion in the future in terms of its development. Um, so they are no longer requesting its continuance. I didn't get any sort of letter or anything from the City of Lockport, um, but I do have that email notes from October 4th, so that was last week. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously voted for approval. Um, and I think that's, uh, I'll answer any sort of questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions? I have a motion to approve. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Uh, any objectors to this change? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, other, other business? Uh, Text amendment for uh, street uh, numbering and signs. Uh, fire step. You, you can do it there if you like. Oh. Um, maybe at the end of July, between our office, 911, and land use, we found a little discrepancy in the way the ordinances are written for hosting of house owners. I don't think we were aware of this before. Were we Brian back when everything no. was done? Okay. Um, so what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to make everything be in line with one another. So we want the house numbers to reflect the same as what land use has, which is the six inch. And then we'd like some wording on there to have at least three inch numbers on mailboxes or street signs that are at the end of their driveways. We believe that the three inch is what that was meant for originally, but wasn't stated that way, and has been misconstrued, and we want to correct that. Okay. Any questions? When you, when you uh, do that, are you going to say all the existing people have to redo all their stuff? No. Okay. So that's yes, only for new forward. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted I just wanted to ensure that no one would be in code violation for this three inch, six inch thing. I think it's good, the size is good, so it's easier to read, especially for our uh, emergency. They can see it, so I think that's good. But uh, I certainly hope there's no violations that somebody would get uh, doing in a, some sort of addition or something to their house that they would be a problem. I think that, I don't know, maybe we should put that in there or something because some things always come back to bite us, it seems. Do you have any comment on that, Mike? Uh, I suppose I could just add some background. Uh, the Will County Building Ordinance has required addresses to be six inches in size for, for many years. And that was something that the building inspectors were inspecting during final inspection. Um, just so happened this summer on one house, the final inspection was performed and it was noted that the letters were three inches in size. That's the first time it's come up um, in at least the two years I've been with the building department. So we want to figure out, well, why are those addresses only three inches in size? And that's when we discovered that 911's code only required three inch letter sets. Um, so that's the discrepancy. We want to address that. 911 is going to move their ordinance up to six inches in size to be consistent with the building ordinance. So any existing addresses that are not six inches in size were done so legally because the, the previous code allowed for that. Second. You have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next 
next item is building code permits. Mr. Valley. I create a uh, I created a resolution uh, which I passed out earlier, but I was informed by our chief of staff that uh, this requires a ordinance change, not a resolution. So uh, the, basically the ordinance change would be the same as what I wrote in the resolution. And I'm saying that when you uh, are forced to get a building permit for maintenance items, it's illogical because people aren't doing it. And if you're gonna replace a door, it's only two hinges or three hinges. If you're gonna replace a window because it's leaking air or whatever reason or wood you're at it, and you take the window out and put a new window in, you shouldn't need to get a permit. If you uh, have a, a piece of siding that's coming off your house, you shouldn't need to get a permit to put a new piece of siding on. If you have a roof that's leaking and you want to patch it, you definitely shouldn't need to get a permit to, re, you know, to fix a leaking roof. If you want to put a whole roof on, just the shingles, you're not changing the structure. So I would imagine that would be something that we could discuss whether you needed to get a permit for changing the whole roof. But in my opinion, no. How about siding? You're not changing the structure of your house. So, you know, that would be falling in the same category as a roof. If you have, um, you have a fence that's uh, falling down and you want to fix the pole, you're going to, these people aren't doing that. So, the gutters, people are replacing their gutters if they're bad, they're not getting permits. And then if we find out they did it, they get a violation notice. So, I'm saying that anything that's a maintenance item that does not require a change in the structure should no longer need a building permit. Okay, uh, Ray and Tom. Yeah, thank you. Before we go into resolution, I mean ordinance, to change anything, I think, Kurt, you were going to provide us a list with what actually required and what didn't. Was it in here? Uh, Michael's the next one on the agenda. It's integral to this whole discussion. You're quite correct, Mr. Cuminello, that when Mr. Bosch brought the matter forward, uh, the direction that we received from the chair last time we were all together was to prepare some background information about what sorts of items currently do not require a permit. And then you asked us to give you some kind of context and feedback so you could evaluate uh, the merits or demerits of this general proposal. Mike prepared that, he's distributed it to you in preparation for this meeting, and he could outline it to, to you. Thank you. Okay, um, Mike, you want to give us an overview of what you presented to us? Sure, sure. Um, in, instead of listing the the hundreds of different permitting scenarios that could exist. What I provided to the committee was the listed exemptions. They're spelled out in the adopted building codes. One being the 2012 International Residential Code and the 2012 International Building Code. In addition to those codified exemptions, I provided to you policy memorandums that I've issued over the last two years using authorized administrative discretion where I declare certain types of activities exempt from permitting requirements. And all those administrative decisions I've made are also included within the packet for your review. Um, Mr. Balch has consistently focused on windows and doors when discussing permitting issues and whether a permit should be required or not required. Um, I believe there's, there's six reasons as to why a permit has been required for window and door replacement. And, and I'll read those um, to the committee right now. First being that window and door replacement is not a codified exemption in the current code. The second is to ensure life safety by ensuring reliable egress in the event of a fire. The third is to ensure that structural changes to the rough opening are done in a manner which prevents structural failure. The fourth, to ensure that manufacturer installation specifications are met 
and failure to meet those specifications could result in the consumer's warranty being voided. The fifth is to ensure compliance with the 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, which is a state adopted code. And the sixth is to ensure that contractors performing such work are registered, licensed, insured, and bonded. Um, at the last land use committee, there, Mr. Balch seemed to allude to the fact that he's received many complaints about the county requiring permits for windows and door work. Um, looking at the number of complaints in total that the land use department has received in 2017, which is 2,069 complaints, only 62 of those complaints were building without permit. That represents 2.9% of all complaints that the county receives. Of those 62 building without permit complaints, two were for windows and doors. That's only 3.2% of all building without permit violations and 0.097% of all complaints the county receives. So, so any statement claiming that there's copious amounts of people complaining about this requirement would be false. I would venture to say fake news. Well, I didn't say... And if the committee wanted to spend their legislative time preparing tax amendments to expand permit exemptions in the county, then the committee should do so. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I didn't say I was getting off to... Am I on? Yeah, I didn't say that I was getting complaints. I said people are not getting permits because they don't know that they need one because they think it's absurd to get a permit for that anyway. So I never said that I'm getting complaints when I'm, I'm complaining because I don't think it's right to have to uh, follow 2012. When we did the code ordinances, I was on that committee and I was told we have no choice. Well, after the committee was over with, when I got appointed, Jim Durkin's our state rep, he gave me a state lawyer to call with all my problems that I had with uh, the building codes. And I was told we don't even have to have any. Then Kurt agreed with me. We can opt out of any part of the 2012 building codes. And I'm saying we should opt out on the part that says you need to have uh, the energy requirement for a window and a door. And you cited safety. You go to Home Depot where most people buy their door, or Menards, or Lowe's, those doors are all, they're not going to sell you a door that's a piece of garbage. They don't even have them in stock. They're selling you all stuff that's okay. And people, you're, you mean that people can't take a, a door and take off either nine screws or 12 screws or six screws, whatever it is, and then put another door up without hiring a guy or uh, paying for a permit fee? You know, it's baloney. And same with a window. The win there's people in this room that replaced windows because they didn't know that you had to get a permit. They thought, no way you need a permit to take one window out and put one window in. All I'm trying to do is make our laws consistent with what the public does. We represent the public. We don't represent the land use or the government. We represent the people. And the people sure the hell don't want to have to have a permit and pay a fee for a permit for maintenance items. And so that's all this, this whole thing is about. And I, I cite doors and windows all the time because those are most obvious. And you say about safety. Well, I get it. If you, if you have a door that's a piece of cardboard, it will burn. But you're not going to find that in a, in a store. To, they don't sell them. Okay. And, and the windows all, you have to have that energy sticker on it to meet the 2012 building codes. Well, the windows that they sell are all good windows. And if, and if it wasn't, the only person that it hurts is if you bought a piece of garbage and you put it in your house, you're responsible. So the, the people that own the home, they're responsible for what's done to it, not our land use department. We, are we mom and daddy? We're going to protect the people from themselves now? And that's what it's all gone down to. Okay. So I'm, I'm done talking because I'm getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check. Cool you off a little bit here, Steve. 
the one thing I disagree uh, about the window, I understand that you need a permit to get change your window, and there is a reason for it. Do I agree with the energy? No, because the majority of the windows that get replaced are going to be substantially more energy efficient than the single pane or the garbage window that you're pulling out. So the energy thing, pulling individuals, if they don't want to buy an energy efficient window, that's their cost. That's it's going to hit them in the pocket. But I don't agree with that. Government should not get involved. The one thing I will disagree with you on, though, is a replacement window. Replacement windows are designed to go inside the actual mainframe of the existing window. So most of the time when people change out their windows, they take the sash, the part that moves up and down or cranks out, and they remove those, and then they put another window in. It's a very easy process, you're right. A homeowner can do it, I can do it, anybody can do it. But when you do that, you effectively change the actual dimension of the interior and exterior of the window. And let's just say you're on the second floor, and you used to have a 30-inch clearance, and a 5.7 square feet of egress to get out of that house, by you changing the dimension and putting in a much smaller window, my fat rear end is not getting out of that window. And now we got a fire upstairs and we got a problem we can't get out of the house. So that's the only thing I'm gonna disagree with is the fact that we do need to make sure that the dimensions of the window uh, don't change because it could cause a life safety issue for the individuals that are on the second story of that house. Any other comments by committee? Well, I'm not myself in favor of ch um, changing my ordinance <clears throat> uh, because of the uh, life safety issues and, and, and changing out uh, building components. I don't think it's a substantial charge for going from that. But uh, I'm not in favor of pursuing this. Judy? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, you saw that the, the list that Steve put together, I was just wondering um, if permits are permits are required for siding right now, if you're replacing your siding, yes. yes. Uh, doors, I know. Heating? If you're putting in a new furnace, a permit would be required. If you're doing repair work, say your blower fan went out, no permit would be required. Call the repair man, have him repair your furnace. Uh, plumbing? Minor repairs for leaks, permit wouldn't be required. Any work that includes new piping, new valves, a permit would be required. New valves, so you mean like, so somebody has Shut off valves, um, you know, various components of the plumbing system. Okay. Uh, cabinets? No. You don't need, I didn't think so. Or counters? No. Okay. Windows we know. Roofs? Yes. No. Flooring? No. That's all I I, I I explained my position on for windows. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me why you feel that it's necessary to have a permit for siding? I'm just curious because I don't see a life safety issue there. Sure. Um, when one removes siding, <coughs> one of the, the major components is that what we refer to as the drainage plant. That's the exterior wall envelope that prevents water intrusion into the wall cavities. Um, Tyvek, house rack, that needs to be installed properly. It needs to be taped, all seams need to be secured. Windows need to be flashed to prevent water intrusion into the house. Siding also has to be installed correctly per manufacturer specifications, or what you'll get is when you drive down the street, you'll see houses that the side looks like a wave. That's because the siding wasn't installed correctly. Right, but that's aesthetic, right? That's more, so. That's aesthetic, but it also, again, goes back to um, manufacturer warranties and manufacturer installation specifications. So you pump twice this spec? Once we do two inspections. Once the tie-back house wrap on, and then once when the siding is up? We do two inspections. One is the drainage plate inspection, and then we do a final inspection once the siding has been hung. Okay. All right, thank you. So that just leads me to a question regarding um, the siding. If those are not put in correctly, just say, didn't get the permit, you guys didn't look at it. That could eventually 
cause structural damage as well. It, it could through, through moist, rot. Correct. So, I mean, even with the waving and that type of stuff, you know, they're revitaling whatever they were, um, you know, the manufacturing requirements were, you're still, you could, you could definitely do damage to structure if these were not installed appropriately okay. by someone that knew what they were doing. Again, I'm just giving up one rationale as to why permits have always been required for this type of work. And if it's the committee's legislative intent to go in a different direction, then um, as the policymakers, you can do that. Yeah, I, I get what the past was, and I don't agree with the past. All I'm saying is that we need to look at this in the way that the people that live in our districts look at it. And they don't want to get a permit for a door or a window especially. And like you said, valves for your uh, shutoff valves. Man, you can make a lot of money you know, going out and finding out all the people that put in uh, shutoff valves without uh, calling for a permit. Because I can tell you what, there's a lot of people that have a shutoff valve on their holes in their backyard. You know, and they didn't call and get a permit to put up a shutoff valve on their holes in the backyard. So, I mean, it's, I'm just trying to get to the point that we're, we're, we're uh, not supposed to be like the guardian of every single person that lives here. They have to take some personal responsibility and hire the right people or do it right themselves. And if they don't, and so the big government's going to come in and fix their problems for them and force them to do what the government says is necessary. Like Grace says, with a window that someone it's too fat, they can't. I could fit through a lot of windows. You know, <laughs> come on. I mean, time to remember balance sheet. It's absurd. So, I guess where we're coming at, if, if we don't take this up, we don't take it up. But the people in our districts ought to know what the board thinks. I'm probably the only one in the room on a lot of stuff, but I don't really care. That was the only one last vote. Okay, uh, John Moran, do you have a comment? Thanks, Tom. Um, you know, it's not just a person who's living at the house at the time. It's people who are future owners or future residents in the houses. You put a window in that doesn't have the right uh, classification of safety glass, a kid falls through the window, gets killed when it gets caught by it. Uh, you put a door in or you replace a door or a window, you don't put the proper wood framing above it to, to have the person change the size of the window. Uh, the siding is a building envelope, protects the house from moisture. You get uh, mold growing in the house. We've had out-of-town, out-of-state contractors come in after storms, replace roofs, do shoddy workmanship, leave town as soon as the job is over. A year later, the roof is leaking again, the homeowner's left in the lurch. There's a reason, and, and Steve, you sat on the committee the last time we reviewed the building ordinances. There's a reason for all of these things that are in the building code, and it's to protect our residents. It's not to be a hindrance to them or to make things difficult for them. It's to protect them, it's to protect future people who live in those homes. Thank you. Uh, Ray, do you have a No, Okay. Uh, we'll see if anybody wants to help. So, sidebar, so some of these things make a lot of sense and some don't. Um, as far as doors go, you bring out the frame, you, get, you go to Menards, you buy a door, you bring it, doors get worn out all the time for whatever reason. Um, if you're not changing the size, if you're not putting in sliders or uh, double French, French door or something like that, and just going with a regular door, I don't know. People do it all the time, and they're not getting a permit. And so to me, like that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. That um, for one point I'll add to doors. I mean, of course, you have matters of code. I know that time board member Dallas doesn't even want that spoken with this conversation, right? But a second component to doors is. Uh, many people put what, what I would call a double key lock on their front door, and that's where you need a key to unlock it from the inside to get out. Yeah. Well, what happens when there's a fire and they can't find the key? Yeah, you would you, be amazed at how many people install double key locks on doors. It's not allowed. Yeah, but once the door is in, so I can change the lock without you could, right? You could. You could. We can't prevent stupid Doors, doors affect egress, and that's one I, pur I purposely did that on the back door so the kids couldn't get in the in-ground pool. I was afraid so. So I mean, so in, so I'd have been in violation. 
Not necessarily, because if you have a front door uh, that works, that can be your main path of the egress. Yeah, yeah, one exit, exit area, so. Yeah. I want to ask a question about the plumbing. The, on the plumbing, are we talking about the veil? Are we talking about like the piece uh, of the veil? So, so here, here's, a, here's an example. Say someone wants to put a shut off valve in so that in the fall, they can drain their hose bib and then there's no freezing pipe issues. Well, they're going to cut the existing plumbing line and they're going to solder in a shutoff valve. That would require a permit because you are altering the, the plumbing system and the piping. Um, and again, plumbing code is a statewide code and that's enforced by the Illinois Department of Public Health. So what about that sprinkler system? Why do we have to always have these mails checked every year? To so that that's back flow. So that's just for, so it doesn't infiltrate the drinking water. Your drinking water and make you sick. Judy, do you have anything? Just, well, with the, with the shutoff belts, um, I know that people do it all the time. I know that they have an existing system, they know enough plumbing, they put a shutoff belt so that they can turn off outside so that it doesn't freeze up. And they're never ever thinking about um, they're never thinking about it. Now, when we did our house originally, my husband specced it all out because he wanted, he knew he wanted it. So those were all inspected with the regular inspection that you guys did. But I can see somebody coming into a place, buying it, and, and wanting to do that stuff. That's the hard thing is we putting a restriction on something that people think is normal maintenance of their house that they just do automatically and never even at all would think about having to get a permit for. I guess my response is what is the pitfall to that? Um, unincorporated population is somewhere around 180,000 residents, give or take. We had 62 violations issued for building without permit. I'm sure that more than 62 people in Will County did work without permit, right? Yeah. Good point. I mean, it happens. You can't prevent everything. Hopefully, at least the people who went out and hired a, a professional, a contractor to do the work, that contractor did get a permit. And that's you know, beneficial to the homeowner too because if something goes wrong, that contractor has insurance and has a bond that can cover those issues. And I agree with that. Exactly. That's, that's the benefit is that if you do get a permit, they have to, that in, installer has to come here, get approved and all that, have everything. So if there is a problem, then the county can. There's recourse. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll see if there's any sentiment to continue this uh, discussion. Um, on Steve's proposal, so let's make a motion. I make a motion we continue discussion it and uh, maybe uh, come up with some parameters that we could uh, move forward on. Is there a second? Second. Okay, let's have a roll call on this. No, we, we're voting on just follow up to discuss it based on each. Yeah, okay. Well, he's discussing for the purpose of change. Mm -hmm. right. Change the building yeah. code. Right, but it's but it's not we have anything permanent. This is just this. No items are named. Right. Okay. We're just going to discuss the change. But uh, okay. nothing more. Of a line item discussed. The line item is in there. Okay. You go roll, please. I'm Michael. Uh, no. I'm Julio Gawa. Yes. Steve Bollage. Yes. Rachel Manella. Yes. Lori Summers? Yes. Denise Winfrey? Yes. Mark Ferry? Yes. <coughs> okay. So, Steve, if you want to work with staff and uh, give them some more definitive things that you want to report. I, I would ask the committee direct county board member Dallas to work on his own and develop his own thoughts mm -hmm. and ideas to present to the committee. No problem. I probably work better on my own anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. I got a computer. I can Google and I can find out all those stuff. Okay, bring your proposals forward, Steve, and we'll take them one by one. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chairman, sure. let me be clear here. I think you know. Eventually, as you know, things have to be put into proper 
legal language. So I think the matter is that uh, perhaps Mr. Bollish could work with the chief of staff to articulate precisely what section of the existing code is to be amended and that it be put into proper legal language so that it can be brought forward to you for vote up or down. I think continuing discussion about the general policy direction, I think you've had a very good and robust discussion about that. But if it's about changing specific language in the existing ordinance, I really think it'd be more expeditious for all concerned that Mr. Bosch would work with the board's chief of staff to come up with the specific legal language that he'd like to propose as an amendment to the existing code. Yeah, I, I've already talked with the chief of staff, and uh, I was told that, uh, this, like I said earlier, this was a resolution that I wrote myself. And uh, she told me that a resolution won't work, you need an ordinance change. Yeah. And that it's a whole different uh, legal framework. And so I'm already working with her, and uh, she'll help me out, I'm sure, I hope. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> hey, Tom. Come on. <laughs> we'll move on to uh, um, Mike didn't have anything else. Uh, fences and walls. Uh, the uh, this was the electric fence uh, proposal. We have a motion to Second. approve. Second. Any comments or discussion? Any objectors? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we've got an item about bees. Um, Judy Montello or Debbie. Tell her she likes to Yeah, tell her Debbie. There is Judy Montello actually. She used to work for hospice. She's a nurse and she used to work for hospice. Um, good morning, or should be good afternoon. Uh, I have a constituent, Mr. Charlie Peterson, who is here in the room. If you'd like to hear speak, he will do so. Uh, who just now found out he did not know he was supposed to have an artist for bees. Uh, found out he, that he did not have to have a, he had to have a permit, he did not know so. But going forward on that, I want to just give you a little history of bees. Without bees, we would no longer have the following fruits and vegetables. Broccoli, asparagus, cantaloupes, cucumbers, pumpkins, blueberries, watermelons, almonds, apples, cranberries, and cherries. You would n Nobody here would be able to eat any of those fruits or veggies if we did not have bees. Uh, that's not even taking into account the pollen they use to, uh, for other food services that you don't feed cows, pigs, so we would probably not have as much meat around. So quite frankly, we need bees to live because they do a very good service. And as anybody has heard, the bee population is uh, going down in the world, not just here, it's a worldwide problem. So uh, I say we need these bees more so than we need chickens. And why do I say chickens? Um, this same board at one time, yeah, chickens. This board at one time, it, came to the board's attention that it costs more to apply for a permit and to have chickens than it costs to have the chickens. This is the same issue with the bees, which in my estimation is more important than the chickens because we need these bees for us to live properly. But uh, what I would like the board to do is to take into consideration uh, lowering the fees or getting rid of the fees uh, for bees like they did recently, not within the last year, I believe, I don't remember. I remember sitting in the audience with, like they did for the chickens. So if you would like any more information, um, Mr. Peterson is here and would be help, we'd be glad to ask any questions. He does live on the, you know, he does live on like an acre and a fourth, Mr. Sure. Peterson. You know, you can have a horse on there without a permit, but you can't have two beaters. Okay. Uh Charlie, did you want to come down and say anything? No, Debbie, something's saying anything about the chickens. I just oh, said. Um, it costs more for, for people to get a permit to put their parents in their backyard. That's so. true, right? <laughs> okay. But if you don't have bees, you can't live. You're welcome to die. Generally, you need parents to live. 
Yeah, you do, right? <laughs> yeah, but at that point in time, they're not, you know, they've already done their duties. <laughs> Um, I'm just a hobby teacher. I only have uh, about Maybe ten. Name, please. I'm Charlie Peterson. I live in Elwood, okay. and um, I was recently cited for a witness violation for bees where I'm at. I'm going to take a report and pass it past year. But just from a general standpoint, only uh, bees in Will County. You know, people who keep bees in Will County without permit, much like you did for chickens, would be helpful to kind of expand you know, the hobby for me. So, if you have any questions specifically on bees? What is your property zone? Uh, R2A. The exact uh, ordinance was 155-10.10-B, which governs tickets to the big needles and stuff like that. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Um, how many bees do you have? How many? About ten hives. Okay. okay. And the ordinance rates, is we're overseeing this, is there, is it like, you have to have specs, like you said, for building You have to have a special use permit to keep bees on the property. Okay. For various types of specifications. Okay. Um, I actually can agree with that. I understand all that. And um, I've actually, if I can, to have them, because of the size of my home, but we did plant um, the natural flowers and I've let my milk leaves pretty much go as it will just to attract not only the bees but the butterflies. Um, you know, I think it's a good idea to maybe decrease the fee. I think you're doing all the good um, by adding these in because we do need them. Okay, I've had them for 11 years. So you, this just now. happened? It's just, this just happened. Okay. So, you know, to me, it's, it's a hobby. When I go, the bees are going to go with me. They won't be on the property anymore. Correct. You can move so it's not like I'm building a, a shed or something like that or a structure. I'm here doing something else. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I had a question. How okay. can, what you're talking about decreasing the bees, uh, how much? Would you decrease it? The other thing is, could we just exempt, you know, make an exempt use like we, you know, like a dog? Could be a permitted use. A permitted use. I didn't know the right word. But, uh, you know, that would make more sense just to make it a permitted use. Then, I know my garden stinks because there's no bees. Why don't you get his business card? <laughs> you know, I, I planted flowers that uh, attract bees and the bees still get to come. So, you know, I, I think maybe that's the answer to uh, just make it a permitted use. Well, right now, there's it's permitted use on E1 and E2, so we'd have to bring it up to, say, R1, R2, R2A, something like that. Staff, do you have any comments on this? Well, I, I'd say that uh, the real question here, of any time we look at special uses or zoning or whatever, the fundamental issue that's always before you, whether the topic is bees, pigs, echo units, or whatever, is the concept of compatible use. What you're really asking yourself is the question, it's easy to get all focused on the one specific issue or the one specific issue or plight of the individual petitioner. As policymakers, it would be my suggestion that what you need to do is step back and ask yourself, is this particular type of use compatible in terms of the public health and safety with adjacent issues? Now, there's not one absolute answer to that. That's why you get to make the big decisions. Uh, I'm not expressing a point of view one way or the other, but some might suggest that chickens can be contained. They can oh, be contained. Whereas bees, by their very nature, fly next door. You're very used to dealing with questions like open burning. You know, the open burning you're doing there is drifting over and causing my asthmatic child to go into convulsions. You probably need to consider, I, I don't know what your eventual decision will be, but you probably need to consider in certain kinds of zones 
that allows certain types of dimensions to the individual properties within those zones, what is the likelihood that the socially beneficial things associated with having bees, like cherries and broccoli, how might that be overcome when that bee flies over next door and puts a child into anaphylaxic shock? So these are the types of considerations you need to, to give. I think if we were really to approach this, it's probably not going to impact this gentleman under the existing law in order to come into compliance. He's either going to have to pursue the special use permit as the law currently requires, or he's going to have to remove the bees. But let's say he removes them and you work legislatively to change the matter, you might be able to have them by right at some point in the future. But I think before you get to that point, once you take a systematic look at, well, what are the allowable dimensions of parcels in certain kinds of zones, and what are the kinds of situations that would be appropriate given that health and safety risks inevitably associated with bees. I can tell you, R2A, there's a certain minimum size, but there can be all sorts of different configurations of those types of lots. This is why the board, in its wisdom, put in provision for special use permits, so that you could look at the particulars of a given situation, how that particular lot is configured, what the uses are adjacent to it, so that you can make an informed decision about whether, in this particular instance, the public health benefits are, are not outweighed by the potential costs. So I guess I'm just trying to share with you, these are some considerations I really think you need to take before making a, a change in the current law. Judy? What is the cost for special use permit for these? Ryan, you want to comment on that? So the, several years ago when the committee updated the fee structure, they considered a um, residential special use for under one acre would be $675. Um, so I believe in this situation, based on where the bees are uh, kept, there is a way to write a legal description, which I think you can do fairly easy, of just saying the west half of whatever lot and such and such subdivision that this is in. There's your legal description, $675. Um, this property is in violation, and per the fee ordinance that was passed by the board, it would be subject to a violation fee in this case. Um, so it'd be 675 times one and a half in this case. But in normal cases for people that just want to apply, it would be $675. Ridiculous. That's under an acre, you say it's an acre. He's in order. But you can define a special use area that is less than the totality of the parcel. So he doesn't keep his bees on every square inch of his 1.7 uh, acres. He keeps them within a defined area. It's very typical, very standard, that you would define this, the area within the parcel that you were granting the special use for, for a defined area that was sometimes significantly less than the size of the total parcel. So what Brian is saying is if that area, you, do you believe your bees could be contained within an area under an acre? They go where they want. <laughs> no, I mean I, the, the actual use, oh, the hives. The actual use is like, like 10 by 20. Yeah, well, that, that's what the gentleman just said. The actual area that is given over to the keeping of bees is only by 10 by about 20 feet. So you could determine a special use area that was much less than an acre. But then in that case, it would be 675, assuming this wasn't a violation case. But, 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 what this, but in the beginning, Mr. You know, Mr. Peterson, you were told around $1,100. I was told uh, $1,250 plus another half. Because of there the you go. That's, that's what he was told when he was approached. So the whole property. Right. right. That's, that's what it was told. But it doesn't have to be the whole property. No. Right. So you have that happen. Yeah. So that was his understanding. So, I mean, that's a lot of money. You know, you're talking about $1,500. So let me ask you a question, Tom. What are we being asked to discuss today? If we want Making to the permitted use or lowering the fees or... What did you do for the chickens? We made it was the permit. I'm just trying to find out what okay, the board... What are we asking for today? I think the easiest way would be to make it a permitted use 
uh, rather than change our fee structure. I, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not really in favor of making a permitted use in, in a bunch of different zoning. I mean, we, we really have to look at the ordinance. I do not have the ordinance even in front of me to understand where where it could even be a special use, or I, I think we, we should look at that. But for this today, I'm understanding that this is just solely a uh, fee reduction to help him get in compliance for something he's been doing for kind of 11 years already. I'm sorry? 11 years. 11 years. Is it, am I correct in assuming that? That's true. Uh, Kurt, can we waive a fee for someone like that on an individual well, basis? You, you, you can waive the fees. I wish the state's attorney was here, but he's not. Um, but I will tell you, it has been a long standing policy of the board. Oh not to do so uh, you know it's up to you but believe me there will be every single person will think of a reason why their case is special and why the fee should be waived right I understand I was just asking what, what's before us today that's what I'm just trying to I have no it. idea that this <laughs> item was put on by the board <laughs> well, I asked this to be put on okay right. and you know I'll pour my constituent you know when he was looking at what you know fifteen sixteen hundred dollars you know, and, and actually right now he's saying either pay up or get rid of your fees. And, you know, he's well, I think part of the issue is on the fee is that, like I said, when I go, the fees are going. Well, yeah. It's kind of not pretty the permanent structure on there. And sometimes they die off. So we could have 10 now and five in the, in the spring, or none in the spring, depending on the weather it goes. It's, it's an agricultural pursuit, you know, however you want to. So let me just ask, for clarity, what you said before about the fees, that's not a, any, not correct because it, we can define a special area. What is the thing that you are asking for today? I think I'm asking, Mr. Peterson's asking, we're asking is, um, you know, we, we need to look at this. You know, can we look at this a little bit forward? Uh, I think he's also asking not to get rid of his fees today. You know, can he hold off until the board makes a decision? You know, uh, and whatever that may be, so so he can, you know, then come to a decision. Uh, because I don't think it's fair to say we're going to take this up. You know, and in six months we'll have a whole new decision, and he may be okay with that, and he get rid of all his bees. You know, I mean, they just don't come and go. It, it's from what I understand, they just don't come and go as you please. So you're asking us to consider a special use permit? I ask for special use permit. Yes, thank you. What is it said again? Your, your special idea. use permit. Are you going to define it? Yeah. To suspend it? Suspend it? Yes. Then, then that needs to be applied for, and then that needs to go through the regular process where it would be heard by the Planning Zone Commission. Right. And then they come in and ask for a reduction in fees after the special use yeah. permit is applied. Uh, yeah. process. Right. Let, let me uh, try to say this succinctly. Um, you know, there have been circumstances of a somewhat similar nature where um, if the individual were in this case to file within the next week to 10 days uh, for a special use for a lesser area, something less than an acre, and he could look at the idea of the 675, uh, although there is the violation surcharge on that, if he could look at that, then uh, the department will forego further enforcement activity at this time. But I do think it's a rather slippery slope that if we simply say, well, because someday the board might change the law, you can do whatever you want to do until we do that. But I do think reasonable people could set a reasonable deadline that, sir, if you do actually apply and submit your fee and so on and so forth uh, within 10 days from today, then during that 10-day period, the department will suspend its enforcement activities. But if that were not to happen, then we'd have to go forward because he's violating the existing law. Well, in the case of the chickens, uh, you bring this up. Uh, they filed for the permit. They went through the entire process. They were approved. They got to take care of it. And then they came back for a reduction of fees at a later time, correct? We gave a refund. A refund. That was, but that was after the whole process. Mm -hmm. The board member to know, and that's what I was trying to point out, is that with the fee schedule adopted by the board, you have to make your payment up front and then request a refund. Right. 
and there is no waiver. But once he, but once he does that, he'll go into the actual process, and then once the process starts, then the enforcement of his activities will be over until he goes through the entire process. So that buys him a lot of time. That'd be correct. And then what we learned today, instead of it being nearly two thousand dollars for the fee, you know, it would be he could apply for just a smaller area. It would be six seventy five. And then I don't know what your ability is to do to to waive the enforcement portion of the the fee. Maybe you guys could work with them on that so it could be even less. But I mean, I, I'd always like to waive fees, but the board hasn't given me that discretion. Right. The board has adopted a fee schedule, and it, it's not granted to probably blessedly in the opinion of some. It's not granted to the land use director to arbitrarily waive fees. Well, I'm just telling you, as a board member, if it came up before me, I would remove that 50% fee increase that they did. I mean, if I had a chance to vote on it, just hearing the plight of the story. I, I have been told the board in the past has has waived those fees. Yeah, but it, it's All the, the process. It has to be done right. We can't waive the fee right now because there's no fee. There's no fee, right. Fee. There's no fee. right. Uh, Charlie, what's your pleasure? Do you, do you want to apply for a special use for a smaller portion? Or try to wait for us to maybe change our ordinance, which we probably won't do. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of on the spot. There may be something that you want to think about. We don't, we don't, we don't know if, if we'll do that or not. The problem is he's in an enforcement issue, so now he's got a land use saying you have to be in compliance. And by the time, you know, if, if you know, well, he can the speed of government. He can apply for the special use permit and they'll hold off on the report. Right. But he doesn't have to make that decision as a part of this meeting. He can go home and think about that and make his own right. decision about whether he right. wants to apply for special use or not. Can I get clarification? You mean for the whole, the 600, 675, not the 1100, right? Is what you're talking about? If right. they do the smaller, if they do the smaller, if they did the whole property it would be about eighteen to nineteen hundred dollars. Right, he almost two thousand dollars right. for the whole property. Right, and that was what we were first. All right, you can go think about it and talk to Debbie and see if you want to bring this back to us in the future. Please let me be clear because once we depart, everybody will have their own recollection of what occurred. So it should be in the minutes that the penalty is not being waived arbitrarily right now. The gentleman is in an enforcement situation, so we are able to, under existing laws, to define a special use area that would be less than an acre. That would be the 675, but Brian, how much more will it be given the fact that it is a violation situation? So the, all right, that was $1,013. Okay, so that's less than what it would have been if he had sought the special use permit for the entirety of his parcel, certainly. But it is a business decision that he needs to make, and certainly the gentleman should not be put on the spot. You want to make it right now, but when we leave here today, I think what I want you to know that it's the uh, intent of the department to give the gentleman about a good solid two weeks to make up his mind if this is what he's going to do. But if on that 14th day, there hasn't been an application for a redefined special use permit received, then we will continue our enforcement process. May the minutes so note. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was our last item of business. Uh, reports and communications. Uh, I have no uh, reports. Committee members, any comments? No. Uh, anything else we haven't talked about? Director, any comments? Uh, any public comment? No public comment? Uh, a motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Or adjourn. Thank you.